Good afternoon. I want to thank everyone for coming here today. Um, hopefully everybody was safe over the last 24 hours and got in okay today. Um, I want to thank my colleagues in the Republican Conference who are joining us here today to talk about um, the One House budget, uh, which, we, which I saw for the first time yesterday, uh, at least the resolution. And then, you know, we've dissected that. We've tried to get as much information. You all know, many of you have covered the state capitol long enough to know that very often one house budgets aren't really worth the paper they're printed on. Um, but they're no doubt a marker of where, in this case, the Senate Majority Conference, where they really are, what their priorities are. So whether they come to fruition completely or not, this is what their conference believes is important. And what we saw was important, first and foremost, they think spending money is clearly important. When the Senate Republicans last were in charge of the Senate, the budget was $170 billion. That was final budget. Since then, the budget has climbed to, I know the governor proposed a $227 billion budget. Their budget, their fiscal plan is $9 billion more than the, than the governor's proposed budget, which would bring us to an all funds $236 billion billion dollar budget. I, I just fail to comprehend how they believe this is sustainable when New York is already, and you have, you have national folks going on CNN saying that New York is uninvestable. Businesses should not do business here. We're already our, our state budget, as I've said numerous times, and you've probably heard me say numerous times, is already larger than Florida and Texas combined. They have more people. Florida soon will have more New Yorkers. And yet, we continue to $9 billion more. Now, you might ask yourself, well, where is that money being spent? Well, it's being spent, um, in one case, to provide full health care to illegal immigrants 60, 65 or younger, as well as 65 or older. They got rid of the delay. The governor had a delay for the 65 and older, if I'm not mistaken, or that was delayed. They want to do away with that. And 65 and younger, Medicaid eligible, the essential plan. What's important for people to understand is the federal government will not cover or offset that cost in any way because they're not U.S. citizens, which means the state of New York will not only expand the number of people significantly that are on Medicaid, but we will cover that, that full boat, full cost to New York taxpayers, including people who, as we know, can turn, continue to struggle to pay for their own health insurance. Maybe they have to work multiple jobs to pay for that health insurance. They, another priority of the Senate Democrats, as clearly as we know, are those who have broken the law. I can only term it as an obsession. They are obsessed with people who have broken the law, who have raped, murdered, robbed. They have no, by the way, they do not share the same obsession with the victims of crime. So we'll, we'll, we'll step, we won't talk about the bill that would create a pension system for those who are in jail. That'll come up, I'm sure, post-budget. But they got rid of the, they rejected the governor's bail changes. Now, I thought the governor's bail changes, while not nearly enough of what was needed, because there was more, she stopped short of that, maybe because she anticipated a very tough negotiation. But as we've seen, they aren't even willing to go where she wants to go, which is to remove, that, the, or to remove the language of least restrictive means. So they want no changes to bail. They think bail is not a problem the cashless bail. They think crime is not a problem. And that's why they've rejected her changes. Um, they also included clean slate. So again, not only rejecting changes to improve public safety, pushing policies that will continue to release more people from jail, dangerous people who have not completed their sentence, by the way. They just got to a certain age. And so we're going to push them out. 
they, when it comes to the governor's energy proposals, they want to go even further. They want to move up the timeline. 2025, that's too far in the future. The planet might not make it that far. So we got to move it up by a whole year for new construction, all electric, all renewable. They want to, this might be the most ridiculous one, they want to actually come up with like a, a fund to make fossil fuel companies pay for climate change. No due process, no actual claim of, you know, your company did X, just the fact that we're, you know, we have, we have climate change, global warming, whatever term you want to use, we're going to make the fossil, because that's what it's really about. It's really about going after fossil fuel companies. It's not about the planet. We're not solving the, whatever's going on with the planet from New York. This is about hammering fossil fuel companies, putting them out of business if they can, and by the way, it's about spending money because they want that money. They want to bring it back into New York coffers so we can, in my view, continue to waste it and not spend it on things we should be. Um, so needless to say, our conference, uh, you know, we'll be touching on uh, more things over the next coming days and weeks. Uh, I believe we're going to be voting on this resolution on Thursday. Um, but if this is what where Senate Democrats think New Yorkers' minds are. We saw, we've seen polling, we've seen what the governor's energy proposal upstate, 73% opposed to it. What are they gonna think of this? We've seen that people have said affordability is an issue. This budget does nothing to help New Yorkers who are facing affordability challenges. It spends more money. It grows the budget. By nine billion, the Senate Democrats want to spend nine billion dollars more. They want to increase taxes because you can't pay for nine billion dollars on on magic. They want to increase taxes on people who are already fleeing the state of New York, who fund the largest portion of the budget, forty percent, by most recent estimates. And again, um, they are not at all concerned with victims. They are obsessed with those who have victimized um, and they continue the virtue signaling of going after whether it's fossil fuel companies um, or others um, even if it's not even constitutional because I really question the legality of setting up a fund. You know the Superfund site which is something I've supported that actually you, you actually have a, a, an acknowledgement from companies that yes, we polluted this piece of property or this area or what have you. You don't just say, you're in this business, so therefore you owe us money. That's what this does. Um, it's wrong. Uh, I don't believe, again, it's constitutional, but uh, the biggest takeaway is that this budget spends, their resolution spends $9 billion more they're laser focused on protecting people who've committed crimes, who are in jail currently, releasing those people where they can, regardless of whether they've uh, fulfilled their sentence. Uh, they've done nothing. Talk about uh, the unemployment insurance. There's nothing about that. Even the assembly, my colleagues in the assembly Democrat, they actually put up, I think, $2 billion? $2 billion. Some recognition that this has to be paid down and that our businesses are getting stuck with the bill. My colleagues in the Senate, no such acknowledgement, no such recognition. So very disappointing, very frustrating. Um, I'm joined again by my colleagues. I wanna thank uh, Senator O'Mara for his role thus far in the budget as our ranker on the Finance Committee. He will no doubt um, be someone you'll all, you'll all be familiar with on Thursday uh, when he leads our debate on the floor um, on this resolution. Although it will not be limited, I'm certain to him. Uh, I want to thank Senator Lanza and all of our colleagues who participated in the hearings. And I want to thank New Yorkers who participated in the hearings. And I'm sorry that some of your concerns have fallen on deaf ears, but we'll continue to uh, do the best we can from our conferences. So happy to take any questions at this time. Let's keep it to the rezo at this point. If there is, for some reason, any off topic, um, we can do that afterward. So on, on the um, uh, provision in there, I think it actually, correct me if I'm wrong, they, they expand the 
uh, phase out of natural, new natural gas hookups mm -hmm. uh, in new construction. Could you talk a little bit more about your concerns there and what sort of effect that would have? Sure. Well, forgetting the fact that, as I mentioned, uh, uh, most of my constituents are, and, and upstate are vehemently opposed to this because it would have, I think, more of a significant impact upstate. Um, this is, tw it, I think the, the, it changes it up to December 31st, 2024. I mean, we're in 2023. This is, to me, it's, it's you're going to, gonna, at the same time the governor's talking about building more housing, this is going to make building more housing more expensive. There's no two ways about it. That's why there's not enough housing in New York that's affordable, because housing to construct in New York is more expensive than other states. It's more expensive than our sister states, like Connecticut and New Jersey and Pennsylvania. If she thinks this is going to help that, it's wrong. Now, again, I know this is not her proposal, although I think her proposal is bad enough. But this is going to make housing more expensive. It's going to make people think twice about whether they want to build a new house in New York, which we already know people are. We give them plenty of reasons to, to, to double think that decision anyways every day. Uh, and so uh, I think, I think from just from, from that standpoint, it's going to make, it's, I'm sure the, the real estate market, uh, uh, home builders, uh, are going to be significantly concerned about this kind of proposal because it, also it goes into it goes into effect literally uh, a year and, and a half from now. And, and just to follow up, what should be done in order to kind of deal with utility costs that a lot of people are facing? Well, so let, let's 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 talk about why utility costs are already high. Many times they're high because of the taxes that are levied on the delivery of the energy to someone's home. That's that's the first thing. Um, in some cases, they're high because they're getting propane or home heating oil, and that's a delivery, right? They, they don't have uh, infrastructure that delivers it right to their home. You know, does natural gas, by the way, um, which is how, what, how I heat my home. But electricity, if everyone has to go to full electric, that's not going to make utility rates less or cheaper. By almost every account, it's going to make those, their utility bills more expensive, and that's when it's going to really hit home for a lot of New Yorkers. Because I know most people, like me, they don't read their whole bill. They don't know what goes into the whole bill. They just look at the bottom number. What's the final number? This is going to increase that bottom number. And then people are going to call their senator and call their assembly member. But it's going to be too late because it's already going to be in law. And so this is not going to do anything to make people's utility bills less. It's also not going to do anything to make people's utility uh, energy more reliable. Uh, just here in Albany. Uh, I happen to know someone who had their family over last night because they lost power and they have four little children and they had no heat. And I don't know if they still have heat because they lost electricity. Um, they didn't have a natural gas uh, boiler or fireplace or wh whatever it was. So uh, these are things that uh, we've been talking about for a long time. The Senate Democrats really are just doubling down and trying to pull the governor even further, which was why I advised her initially that she shouldn't have led with this proposal, that my colleagues in the Senate would try to do all they could anyways. And I think she's just set herself up to be pulled further to the left on this issue. W-E-N-Y. Um, how do you feel about, so the Senate Majority Leader said that you know, judges have a decent amount of discretion and they say the focus should be more um, on into like mental health, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. We, we can do well. First of all, giving them discretion doesn't cost a dime, so we can put money in mental health. And this conference has supported that. And I actually have come out in support of the governor's bringing more beds online. That's a good thing. Governors or uh, judges do not have discretion. Find a judge that will tell you that today they have discretion. They do not. The least restrictive means that language. That's literally what the law says. The least restrictive means is almost always not, you know, releasing them either with an ankle monitor or whatever it means, but it's, they're on the street. Ankle monitors, by the way, are very easy, as I have found out uh, or heard from law enforcement, to remove from your ankle. Um, and so, so the idea that judges have discretion tells me that, my, unfortunately, my colleague has not spoken to any judge. She certainly hasn't spoken to a DA. Because if she would, even Democratic DAs like David Soros, they would tell her, this has to come out. That's why the governor chose it. She knew, because she ran a campaign where crime was a major issue. And this singular law was a major issue. Um, and we should do more than that. We should actually apply a dangerous standard for judges. So we want to give them more discretion, not just some. 
They want to give them none. The other corollary to that is the fact that it's counterproductive. The bottom line is, if you want people to go to diversion courts, they need to get to judges so that judges can actually send them to diversion courts for mental health, for substance abuse. If they never get to a judge and a judge never has the discretion, they'll never be able to get them the assistance that they need. Right. So even the majority leader's own position doesn't make sense. Michael. Michael. I have not seen the study. Um, and, and, and I guess eventually you can find someone to support a bad position. Because most folks that I know, not writing a white paper behind a desk at a university or think tank, but some, these are district attorneys. John J. Flynn, Democrat. David Soares, Democrat. I can also name some Democrat DAs who aren't DAs anymore who supported our position on bail because they lost because they got tagged with being supportive or just being in the in, in the crosshairs, so to speak, politically. But the reality is these folks are coming out against this law because they're seeing it every single day. They're seeing victims who are not getting justice and they're seeing more dangerous people on the street under the guise that somehow no discretion for judges is somehow more just than providing judges who are sometimes very often elected locally to provide some level of discretion to look at someone and say, you've been arrested 10 times in the last two months. I think you're a danger to yourself and the community. I think you should be held. That's our position. And I would be willing to bet, forgetting John Jay, that the study by New York voters and New York residents would back up our position. Um, and so I haven't seen the study, Michael. I will look at it. And I can be happy to follow up with you at a later date on that. So my, I had a meeting with the governor, she said that she was gonna, she knew this would be a, 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 as she put it, a bloody point of negotiation. And she was anticipating a, a rough and tumble negotiation. I asked her point blank, are you gonna really lean in on this? Because if you don't, it will not happen. Now we'll see, we all know there's horse trading. Does it get traded away? I don't know. But I, I'm gonna hold her to her word at this point um, that she needs to lean in. If she doesn't, no one else is fighting for victims out there. No one else is fighting for, for, for the DA's position, for law enforcement position, uh, to give judges more discretion, to keep dangerous people off the street from re-victimizing uh, New Yorkers. Last question, Zach. So, so uh, Senator, on, on bail, uh, it's been a rough couple months for the governor. Mm -hmm. South Hang and now these one house have certainly reviewed a lot of her mm -hmm. Do you think that she is politically strong enough to withstand this resistance from the Democratic supermajorities. Where is she too weak to uh, win on this? You know, the, the, uh, the easy answer, Zach, is we're going to find out, right, in a couple weeks here. Um, I certainly... Our conference, certainly on the, on, the, on the Judge LaSalle thing, I think, you know, we, we gave her a lot of time to file the lawsuit herself. She didn't. Uh, we had hoped she had reached out to us before it even got to the committee. She didn't. Um, so I felt like there were things, and she knows this, that, that could have been done more from her office to give Hector LaSalle, who would have been a great judge, a better chance at succeeding politically. That didn't happen. A governor in New York, as is, is I've been, and I've been on the other side of this plenty of times, they have a lot of leverage in a budget, maybe more leverage than any other point on any other policy issue in the budget. And we can go back to Pataki v. Silver and all these things. But the governor, so, you know, the question is whether she uses that leverage to enact policies that keep New Yorkers safer as it relates to this issue, or whether she backs off from that because there's other things she also wants. And no doubt this is a tough issue uh, for the Democrats, uh, they've made pl plain they don't want to. They didn't want to do the changes we made cosmetically last year or two years ago. So um, I would tell you that New Yorkers, people who are scared to take the subway, people who are scared to go to the bodega, people who are scared to walk their kid to school, certainly in New York City, in Rochester, across the state, they're counting on her to be strong enough to protect them. And so I hope she is. Would you back her if she goes past the April 1 deadline? Would your conference support her going past that deadline? I mean, 
on this issue specifically, 